In today's video, I will speak a little bit about our experiences um, and why candidates are failing their interviews with top strategy consultancies, right? So speaking about common mistakes that are occurring throughout the entire interview. And um, I will speak about uh, this based on our experience of uh, thousands of data points. So our mentees um, in, in total received more than 500 offers from the MVP, so McKinsey, Bain and BCG, and more than 1000 offers from tier two companies, right? So um, besides that, um, CD and myself have been interviewers for BCG and McKinsey and also senior consultants there, uh, having over one and a half decades experience together. So um, the objective of this video is to get an understanding of what to prevent under all circumstances, right? So um, it, it's not like you, you will adhere to these points or like uh, avoid these points and then you will end up with an offer, but it's the other way around. Like if you um, avoid these points, you will not uh, get, you will not ruin your chances after a couple of minutes into your interviews, right? So um, let's segment this a little bit further to make it easier um, to follow for you and also easier to explain for me. Um, so the first part will be um, on mistakes that uh, can occur over the entire duration of the interview. The second part uh, will be on mistakes that can occur during the fit part of your interviews, where the strategy consultancies would like to get to know you as a person a little bit better and your achievements and your experiences, right? And the third part will be a little bit of a deep dive on the second, because um, we will speak also about McKinsey and the PI, the personal experience interview, which is a special form of the fit part of your strategy consulting interviews. And then let's close this off with mistakes that are specifically happen throughout the case interview part of your interviews, right? So improving up on these points will be absolutely mission critical for you. Um, not again, not because you will get an offer then, but at least to keep you the chance to get one. So you can see this as some selected fundamentals, uh, right? And, and there are many more um, that you need to have in place as a prerequisite to get an offer, right? So keep pushing and improving and let's start with section one. So let's start with section one, mistakes which occur throughout the whole interview. So while there are many mistakes we could mention here now, let us really focus on the three most important ones from our experience. And that is um, first, taking on an oral exam mindset, and I will explain um, this a little bit later. Second, displaying low energy or uh, what we call a lack of enthusiasm. And third, showing the inability to communicate top top, right? So let's go through these one by one. So with regards to uh, one, um, taking on an oral exam mindset. So what most candidates do not understand is that an interview at one of the world's most prestigious um, consulting companies is a mutual discussion. It is not an exam where you have to find the one specific correct solution. This is not what it is. The interview at these companies is a conversation, a conversation which serves a purpose. And that is the purpose to demonstrate who you are as a person and also to demonstrate the relevant qualities which you possess. And many candidates completely overlook this aspect. And the consequence then is a, is a very undynamic behavior where the candidates are very tired, right? And guided by fear of giving the wrong answer instead of really showing what they have to offer. So second, and the second point um, I would like to mention is the lack of enthusiasm, right? Or displaying low energy. And let's let's be honest here, nobody, literally nobody likes to talk to energy drains, right? So you want to make sure that talking to you is a pleasant experience, right? So that also means you need to bring a healthy amount of energy to the table. 
you need to project an open body language and you need to communicate in an engaging way. And this includes, for example, emphasizing certain parts of your sentences while you speak. So according to the messages, which you actually want to emphasize, right? So don't, don't sound robotic. <laughs> That's the main message here. <laughs> Have a normal conversation with, with the interviewer on eye level. Right? And it's also implying to have a certain voice melody. So just make sure that you show that you are full of energy and ready for the job because it can get exhaustive now and then. And third, um, this is really a major one. Um, the lack of the ability to communicate top down. And what does it even mean? So in, in board level strategy consulting, and, and this is what these companies are doing, um, there are very few things that are as important as structured thinking and communication. And consultants usually have to really crisply present recommendations to their clients because their clients are busy executives. And many times they only have a few minutes to communicate that recommendation, right? Everybody of, of you or every one of you will have heard the, 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 the term elevator pitch and the term elevator pitch is really true, right? So you need to be able to communicate within a couple of seconds, the main messages and also make sure that there is a reasonable recommendation attached to this at the very end of your um, case interviews. So, I mean, in the end, what senior clients expect from consultants is to deliver the communication in the form of a clear and crisp message. And then if interested, the client will ask for details as your interviewer will ask for details. And this is top-down communication, right? This is also sometimes referred as the pyramid principle. And this is what candidates will need to show in their interviews to communicate in a structured way with busy executives. A consultant needs just to start with the answer to the executive's question first and then list the supporting arguments. And this is also what a candidate must do with the interviewer during the interview, right? This top-down structure is, is pretty counterintuitive for most people, especially the ones with a scientific or an engineering background who are really used to, to writing technical papers. And for many people, it's more way more natural, actually, to build up a conclusion by first reciting all of the facts, recounting all of the analyses um, that have been done or reviewing all of the supporting ideas. And then all of this culminates in the final message, right? But this is very counterproductive when interviewing with a strategy consulting company, because this is not how you communicate to senior executives. Executives will completely lose interest if you talk to them like this. And this is a very, very, very frequent pitfall for candidates when they sit in the interviews with strategy consultancies. So let's proceed with uh, section two. So mistakes that happen throughout the fit part of your interviews. And again, uh, there, there, there will be many. Let us take the three most important ones for the moment. And these are shallow answers on the question why consulting and um, why our company? Uh, two, being perceived as dishonest in your answers. And um, three, project the wrong attitude towards the job. So let's take these one by one. So with regards to one, um, the, the first critical area um, are shallow answers to the questions, why consulting and why our company? And a typical answer is if a candidate fails to outline his or her own career objective um, and how consulting in general and the firm in particular will actually be a great platform to achieve these objectives. Um, essentially, the question is, how can you frame your motivation to join this company, right? This is the essential question. And often 
this is where candidates really have tr problems to, to find a good verbalization, right? And um, because this motivation needs to be transparent, honest, and also it needs to sound appealing to the strategy consultancies you're applying for. It's just not enough to tell the interviewers about how great you um, perform in a team and how many industries you would like to see in a very short time and how much you love project work. I mean, seriously, this is what literally everybody speaks about. So please try to, to stand out in some way, right? So you will not, if you learn things by heart as you will find it online, right? So please don't do this. Second, uh, and that's, that's also a critical issue is perceived dishonesty. And here, this is important. What do I mean with perceived dishonesty? It's not ne necessarily plain lying what I'm referring to, right? Um, but it, it is becoming across not as genuinely, um, or entirely genuine, right? So for example, you, you come up with fake weaknesses when asking something like, what are your development areas that you see for yourself? Or what are your weaknesses? And then some candidates come up with extremely um, shallow or superficial answers that is often even trying to imply that your weakness actually is a strength. Like, you know, I'm such a super detailed orientated person and, 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 uh, I mean, yes, there is a negative side, there's a positive side, but this is not what these companies are looking for, right? Some people even make up stuff, which, which then is plain lying. So please don't, just don't. Making up stuff will always backfire at some point, always. And senior interviewers have years, years or even decades of experience. And I've seen hundreds and hundreds of candidates. They sense making things up usually very fast, right? And in addition, this is also really a values issue, right? So don't do it. And third, um, the last critical area I would like to go in is projecting the wrong attitude towards the job. And this can usually span across multiple sub aspects. For example, um, what are the, the kind of project with the best work-life balance, or what are, um, how many free days do I get per year? Or um, what are the perks of, of, of the job, like hotel points and first-class travel and free food ordering and team dinners and so on? I mean, all of that does not tend to uh, come uh, tend to come across very positively, as you might imagine. And also, bluntly speaking, it's just really dumb to, to do that. This might be more or less important for you individually, but there is simply no room in your interview for this. The third section will cover the personal experience interview that McKinsey is using instead of the fit interview, right? So essentially it's a subsection of the fit I just laid out to you but used by McKinsey to assess what have you done in your past and how are your achievements fitting to what the company is looking for and who you are as an individual. And again, um, I want to point out um, three common mistakes we are seeing. The first is selecting weak examples that you're speaking about. The second is the inability to cope with the um, partially extreme deep dives and follow-ups to your situation that you're describing. And third, um, candidates are not focusing enough on what they individually did. And let's go one by one again. So let's start with number one, um, using or selecting weak examples that you are presenting. And this is obviously a mistake. And just to make this a little bit more tangible for you, what do we mean here with weak examples? So most often we see candidates using examples of academic excellence. And this is indeed a problem because examples of academic excellence are only exceptional if they reach a level that nobody, and I literally mean nobody, of your university has ever achieved a similar example, then it's extraordinary. And otherwise it's, it's just a pretty big risk that the interviewer sits there and thinks, well, 
I, I mean, everybody here has like excellent academic achievements. Otherwise, they would not even sit there, right? And and also, most likely, the interviewer by himself or herself has a pretty impressive academic background. Yeah? So these type of examples will most likely do not the trick because they don't differentiate you too much from other candidates um, sitting there. The second issue I would like to speak about is, and that is also very pertinent during the, the PI part of the interviews, is when candidates fail to cope with the extreme deep dives and follow up questions related to their stories. And that's interesting because interviewers often go really into extreme depth of your um, stories to understand the reasons. So it's very important for interviewers why a candidate did something uh, or why the candidate said something. And many candidates do not even understand the core of what they need to transport um, because it is not so much about the what they did, but it's way more about the why they did it. And having no strong answer to these questions, so these follow-up questions, is a very frequent source of doubt that then emerges in the mind of the interviewer. And this oftentimes leads to a rejection in the end. Because the why, the why is really the decisive factor for finding repeatability in everyday in the everyday life of a consultant so in essence you could say one excellent why can produce an unlimited number of excellent what's and let me really repeat this because this is so essential one excellent why can repeat or can produce an unlimited number of excellent what's so, and with regards to the third area and um, the last important pitfall uh, that we want to focus on today is that candidates are not focusing on what they personally did. So very often um, candidates shift in, into the mode of telling their stories in terms of, yeah, and then we did this and then we did uh, this to address the problem. And this, that's just a mistake because even in a team setting, your story always needs to focus on what you individually did what have you done to specifically help the team to overcome certain obstacles or challenges right so you, you still need to clearly outline what you did and how your actions and your words either complemented what others did or even provided guidance to the people around you because this is what the interviewer wants to understand from you the unfortunate truth with regards uh, especially to the PI but also to the fit is that you likely will have little idea if your stories are meeting the bar or not, right? If you have no senior calibration for this. However, in any way, please make absolutely sure to take your preparation for the PI and for the fit parts of your interviews as serious as your case, inter case interview preparation, because they also will be decisive if you end up with an offer or not. So make sure you are prepared for this too. Now in section four, let's also speak about the case interview by itself, right? Um, so what are the mistakes here that we're seeing as the most significant ones? Uh, it's first, the weak conceptual thinking, it's second, the lack of generating so what's, and third, it's the failure to take the interview along. Again, let's go one by one. So with regards to one, weak conceptual thinking. I mean, pretty obviously, um, failure to derive structural elements from a clear logic and a missing link to the core question is not something that will serve you well in your interviews. And very often, candidates misunderstand that structuring, structuring a case does not mean um, just to come up with buckets and, and, and sub-aspects which they need to list. A framework is just never a structure, never. And candidates have to really make clear they will answer the question that has been asked. And, and how they are doing it, right? And if they fail to do so, they are perceived as guessing around and just looking into several buckets randomly 
just hoping to stumble up on some interesting information that will then guide them towards the, the right path. And you can sense this because if, some, if, 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 if candidates are asking something like, is there any information with regards to X, Y, Z? without even motivating why they are asking that and what they will do with the answer, you already know they have no game plan, not at all, right? So they just hope to get this information to make sense out of this and then have a follow-up question on this, but there is no overarching game plan. So please be absolutely sure that you are not perceived as a weak conceptual thinker at all costs. I mean it, at all costs. By the way, this is the same um, when, when asking for, for other things in the interview. You always will need to have a motivation why you ask a question. And a hint from me, it's not out of curiosity, right? It needs to be clear to the interviewer why you're doing what you're doing. And the second point, um, let's also speak about this. Um, so we've seen again and again with unsuccessful, unsuccessful, unsuccessful candidates that they are completely lacking what we call the generation or generating the so what's. And one very classical problem with candidates is that after having um, deep, dive deep into specific analysis, they come back to the interviewer and, and just like uh, declare victory and, 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 and shout uh, the result is like, I don't know, 293. And then uh, there's silence. And there's silence. And this is the moment when the interviewer really raises eyebrows, right? Sometimes only like in his, with his inner eyes, um, but essentially what is expected from the candidate here is not to just spit out a number. You, you need to behave in a client friendly way and that is true throughout the complete and entire case, actually throughout the entire interview. Um, but spitting out a number alone is completely meaningless for a client because clients actually need to understand what this number now means. So this is one of the most critical elements of what we call adequate process discipline when navigating through cases. Nobody is primarily interested in the solution you are coming up with, right? What interviewers are looking for is primarily if you are able to do the job in a top strategy consultancy. And that means you can solve any case question, not only the presented one. So really make sure that you show this. And then finally, the third point, um, this is also something uh, what is unfortunate. It is, it is the failure to take the interview along. And that's a very frequent mistake. So, I mean, some candidates essentially expect the interviewers to read their mind. So they don't share what they think. They don't share their logic. They just do the analysis. And when uh, doing this, they just go silent, do some calculations um, in, in private, right? And, and then they just present the result. That's just the one type. And then there is another type which comes across as extremely disorganized and they are kind of drowning in data and they are losing the focus to show what actually needs to be answered in order to arrive at a recommendation. And this often is even amplified by losing track of their own nodes and confusing numbers and confusing units. So if you have prepared for um, a case interview, uh, you for sure either have spotted this by yourself or you have seen it uh, with some peers uh, that you have been practicing with. But in both cases, this is really weak performance, also in the former case, in the first case, right? Because it is super important that the end result is correct. Yes, that's true. However, also the way to that end result needs to be transparent and understandable by your interviewer at all times, right? So even if it is correct, it's still a, a very weak performance if you don't be trans if you are not transparent about how you arrived there. So again, the interviewer will treat you as you would be in a client interaction and process transparency and also result clarity are two of the most important things. 
So you have to walk the interviewer through your logic and align on this logic. Then you perform calculations while taking along the interviewer. And this is how you would also ensure buy-in from a client in a client second. Because walking the client through the analytical steps and just and instead of just presenting the results is how on a real consulting project, you usually will ensure buy-in for the results. And this is what the interviewers are testing for when they discuss it with candidates. So, I mean, overall, great that you uh, stayed uh, with me for that uh, whole time. And uh, we, are, we are fully aware that this is um, not easy to overcome. Right. So as on all points mentioned, usually candidates taking a rather long time and need significant guidance to overcome these points. And there are many more that they will need to master. However, um, once you have at least overcome a few of them, you are definitely on a good way into the right direction. So um, for the moment, um, goodbye. Try to implement as much as you can from what I've told you and uh, keep pushing.